are they not written in the book of Chronicles of the kings of Judah? So Jehoiakim rested with his fathers, and Jehoiachin, his son, reigned in his place. And the king of Egypt did not come out of his land anymore, for the king of Babylon had taken all that belonged to the king of Egypt from the brook of Egypt to the river Euphrates, which is right there uh, in the same area as Israel and Jerusalem. So when Nebuchadnezzar came into power and started invading on Judah and Jerusalem, then uh, Pharaoh kind of took a step back because he was like, well, these niggas are wicked. You know, give me a second. I'll be back. So, uh, let me get a couple couple scriptures that I had mentioned before. This is the book of Sarat, Ecclesiasticus, chapter 15 and verse 20. He hath commanded no man to do wickedly, neither hath he given any man license to sin. So within Judah and Israel, you know, that may be said, as well as uh, these other nations, because they, they made it up with their little bright minds. Oh, let's offend the heavenly father and his only begotten son. James chapter 1 and verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by Yahweh. For Yahweh cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. So the Lord is not going to tempt us with evil. You know, when you tempt somebody, when you tempt somebody, that means that you give them, uh, you give them a, a, a basically a green light or an avenue in order to do something evil. You know, right now I'm not being tempted with nothing. But when somebody comes around me and they got, you know, it may be some weed or something or, you know, a cigarette or something. I'm not going to feel tempted because, you know, the Lord has built us up in the spirit to be able to resist those things. But, you know, somebody who may have been a weed smoker or, or may be smoking weed, they're going to be tempted by that. But the Lord himself is not going to tempt me mentally because I don't feel like doing none of, those, none of those things now. But another person might come along with that with that tempting spirit within them. So the Lord doesn't tempt us directly. He has certain individuals to do that. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. So each individual is tempted when he makes it up in his own mind. Oh, I want I wonder what would happen if this. That's the same thing that Pharaoh and, and, and Nebuchadnezzar did. You know, they made it up in their mind. I'm going to invade on these people. I'm going to capture these people and take all their gold, you know. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So uh, simply to clear that up, I wasn't saying, um, I wasn't saying that, uh, I wasn't saying that the two thirds aren't going to get it on this side. There's going to be people destroying people left and right. There's going to be people destroying people left and right. But the Lord is keeping tabs of everything, you know, as far as what the what those other nations are doing to the Lord's people, because Jake wouldn't be going off if it wasn't for the other nations. If they didn't push crack into our communities, Jake wouldn't be smoking crack. If they didn't push weed on every corner, Jake wouldn't be smoking weed or cigarettes like that. You know, so ultimately we always say Isaiah chapter 24 and verse five. 
you know, we wouldn't be, we wouldn't have these, look at, uh, there's certain countries where none of that shit is legal, they don't even, you know, they, I, I think there's certain countries where they don't even accept alcohol, there's certain countries where they don't, they don't take none of that, none of those drugs in their communities, Isaiah chapter 24 and verse 5, the earth is also defiled under its inhabitants. Who's in, who's inhabiting the power seat? The so-called white man. So when they push all these things on our, on our people, that's them giving our people that unction to, to, to be enticed and led away by sin and tempted. So the so-called white man is that tempter. Because they have transgressed the law, changed the ordinances, broken the everlasting covenant. So, uh, as I was saying, we know that the two thirds are still going to, to be destroyed in the times that we're in now. They're still going to be, you know, attacked and, and, and destroyed, whatever the case may be. But that doesn't mean that the Lord isn't looking at who's causing that. You know, I'll get that as well. Matthew chapter 18 and verse 6. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. So when you pull, a, when you pull away one of the Lord's children who believes in him and you cause him to sin, the Lord keeps track of that, you know. And most people, it, it, it's not just those who are doing this work. It's those who would profess that they, that they know a, a, a higher power. When somebody professes that they know a higher power, well, if they had the right teaching, in turn, you know, they would they would do the right things necessary to please Yahweh Bahasham Yahweh Shai. But most uh, a, a good amount of people aren't privy to the knowledge when it comes to the truth. So just because somebody's not privy to the knowledge does not give a green light for you to push dope into their communities. Woe to the world because of offenses, for offenses must come. But woe to that man whom the offenses come. So who do the offenses come through? The so-called white man, the so-called Chinese, the so-called Arab. All of these nations that are in that power seat, they're inhabiting. They're that in, the, the earth is defiled because of the inhabitants. Those who are inhabiting the judgment seat, the, the position of power. So I just wanted to clear that up. I'm not saying that, uh, I wasn't saying that, you know, the two thirds aren't going to be destroyed. They are going to be destroyed. But the Lord is still keeping track of everything that the wicked elite are doing in order to cause them to stumble, you know. And that's why I say, uh, that's why I use the parable about if a man has two sons and one is good and one is bad, you're not going to turn, you're not going to not love the son that's not good. You're not going to not love the son that's bad, you know, regardless, you're not going to let no other man discipline your son. You're going to you're going to discipline both of your sons. But, um, you know, the two thirds are just going to, you know, they're going to they're going to get disciplined and destroyed by, you know, the, the adversity, the different things that are getting ready to take place during the time of Jacob's trouble, as well as by those thermonuclear missiles. That's going to be the Lord stepping in and disciplining the two thirds, sending that punishment on the two thirds on the bad sons and daughters. But the good sons and daughters being the one third, they're going to have that mercy. They're going to be in the chariots being renewed and, and, and brought to how the Lord intended for us to be create, uh, uh, how the Lord intended for us to be. But, um, even when the two thirds get punished after they die by way of thermonuclear missiles, when they come back in the kingdom, they're going to be babies that are going to be in, in turn being raised up to be rulers over the earth. So they're going to have crowns on their heads, but they're going to be our, they're going to be the elect. The one thirds sons and daughters. Abaratazaya, how will willing them of that number, as well as those who are sincere in this truth. So, uh, this is all tying back to Joel chapter three and verse four, by the way. But Second Kings chapter twenty four and verse seven, and the king of Egypt which was the, the grandfather of the Philistines, did not come out of his land anymore, for the king of Babylon had taken all that belonged to the king of Egypt from the brook of Egypt to the river Euphrates. 
So the king of Egypt had been imposing taxes or tribute on, Je on Jerusalem right before that took place. And who's related to Mesriam or the king of Egypt? You had the Philistines, which was the grandsons, and you also had Tyre and Sidon, which are of the same forefather, Ham. So they were right next to Israel and Jerusalem. So they were imposing taxes on them and probably, you know, probably trying to bully them. Probably taking all their goods. Now back to Joel. Chapter 3 and verse 4. Now indeed, what have you to do with me, O Tyre and Sidon, and all the coast of Philistine? If Shalakia, and when it read that uh, the king of Egypt did not come out anymore for the king of Babylon had taken all that belonged to the king of Egypt from the brook of Egypt all the way to the river Euphrates. Uh, you can best believe that the Philistines, Tyre and Sidon, they escaped. They got out of there. You know, when they probably came back in back through Egypt and, and found their own land to dwell in, which is why it says that Canaan is occupying South Africa right now. But, uh, you know, they probably came back into Africa, the land of Africa and, or the land of Ham and started dwelling there. But they left Israelites there and they probably took goods as well. But they left Israelites there. They didn't help the Israelites. Indeed, what have you to do with me, O Tyre and Sidon, and all the coast of the Phil of Philistine? Will you retaliate against me? But if you retaliate against me swiftly and speedily, I will return your own retaliation upon your own head. So they have no type of argument to post as far as how they treated us. Because you have taken my silver and my gold and have carried into your temples my prized possessions which are the children of Israel. So they took the silver and the gold, but they also took children of Israel. As you read, uh, Pharaoh Necho took uh, Jehoahaz and made his brother Eliakim king in, in, his, in his stead. But he took Jehoahaz and carried him away to Egypt. That's the Lord's prized possession, possessions, as well as his silver and his gold. And you had Tyre and Sidon and Philistine that was right there next to Judah in Jerusalem. And they're related to Egypt. They're related to Mesriam. And this is the point in which we see that history repeats itself. And this kind of blew my mind because, it, you know, I'm, I'm thinking in the sense of, okay, fast forward time. Also, the people of Judah and the people of Jerusalem, you have sold to the Greeks. And we know that when they left and didn't help us during the time that Nebuchadnezzar and the Chaldeans were invaded on on Judah and Jerusalem. They left us there and they, you know, they went about their way, but they didn't do nothing as far as trying to aid us. They knew who we were, you know. You have sold to the Greeks. Okay, so there was that time period in which they were taking up tribute and, and they were probably in alliance with Nebuchadnezzar, basically saying, hey, leave us alone. Give us, give us some of the, you know. Whatever the case may be, there was probably an agreement between Egypt and Nebuchadnezzar for them to be good. You have sold to the Greeks, and this is where history repeats itself. That you may remove them far from their borders. So during that time, we didn't get removed far from our borders. Judah and Jerusalem did not get removed far from their borders. Now Israel did, because Israel was in the Americas. They had been removed during the time of when Assyria was invaded on us by way of uh, Sennacherib. You know, you had uh, the 10 tribes, the Northern Kingdom in America and also in other parts of the Assyrian uh, Kingdom. But Ju Judah and Jerusalem were still in the land of Judah and they were still dwelling somewhat close to that land. And when Nebuchadnezzar took over, we didn't go nowhere. We were still right there close to our land which is where you have the temple being rebuilt during the time period of the Medes and the Persians. The temple was rebuilt on the same infrastructure, on the same foundation. So this isn't talking about during the time of ancient, during the time when, uh, this isn't talking about during the time of Nebuchadnezzar in Egypt. This is talking about when they sold us to the, to the Portuguese, which are Greeks, to the Portuguese, and they brought us to the Americas and removed us far from our border because Egypt, because Egypt and Judah and Jerusalem, you can travel there on land. 
and you don't got to cross over any water. You could travel there on land on foot. So we were still somewhat close to our border uh, when we were dwelling in West Africa. Because uh, during the time period of King Herod, he had been invading on us around uh, the turn of the century, around 20 AD, when Yahweh was born. They killed uh, every child that was under, under two years old, I think it was. That they had been invading on us. They had been harassing us during the time of Yahweh So we would, even Joseph came down to Egypt and dwelt there for a period of time. Because he realized that they were trying to kill Yahweh But they had been harassing us. So from that time period, Egypt or Ham, the land of Ham, from Egypt to West Africa was somewhat of like a hideout, a safe house to us. So we would come down there and dwell there when they were harassing us. Um, now give me a second. Even during 70 AD, during 70 AD, they just, they, they, uh, seized Jerusalem again. So they had been harassing us for years. But um, they removed us far from our borders. They removed us far from our borders during 1620 when we were in West Africa. When we were in West Africa, that's when they removed us far from our borders. This is the book of Matthew chapter 2 and verse 16. I'll start at verse 13. Matthew chapter 2 and verse 13. The flight into Egypt. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of Yahweh, Bahasham Yahweh Shai, appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word. For Herod, which was an Edomite, will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet saying, out of Egypt, I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived, by the wise men was exceedingly angry and he sent forth to put to death all the male children who were in Bethel and all its districts from two years old and under according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. Then he then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet saying a voice was heard from in Ramah lamentation weeping and great mourning Rachel weeping for her children refusing to be comforted because they were no more the home in Nazareth now when Herod was dead behold an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt saying arise and take your young child and take the young child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the young child's life are dead. Then he arose and took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. And I'll read the last two verses. But when he heard that the that Ar Archelaus, Archelaus was reigning over Judea instead of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned by Yahweh in a dream, 
he turned aside into the region of Galilee. Galilee. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the, by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. So Yahawashai grew up in Nazareth. Um, but simply showing how when, when the people of Israel and, and Judah were oppressed, we would flee into Egypt. We would flee into certain, certain countries within Africa or Ham. So, uh, that's how the Israelites, that's how Judah got to West Africa because we had built traveling routes into West Africa. And there was, uh, you know, we had somewhat built a, a, a rapport with the people and somewhat built up communities. They had a, a, a country there called Negro Land right there in West Africa. It's called Negro Land. And that's where Israelites were dwelling. That was our community. And from that point, we made it with their women. So you got some Israelites that are in North Africa, some Israelites that are in South Africa, East Africa. And even even that within itself, during the Arab slave trade around 600 A.D., you had Arabs that were enslaving us and they were taking us from East Africa. So a good amount of East Africans that you may meet, some of them are Israelites. I've met a few East African people and I'm like, oh, those are Jakes. I could tell those are Israelites, but they say that they're from East Africa. But, you know, if you do your history, you can see that we were in East Africa as well. As well as North Africa and South Africa. Back to Joel chapter 3 and verse 5. Because you have taken my silver and my gold and carried and have carried into your temples my prized possessions. Also the people of Judah and the people of Jerusalem. Now this is a turn, a, a, a repeat in history. Also the people of Judah and the people of Jerusalem. You have sold to the Greeks. So during the time around the 1600s when we had been dwelling in West Africa, uh, they knew who we were. They knew, they knew who Israel was. Because you pe you had people like Massa Musa, you know, you had people that were Israelites that were ruling there in Af in Africa, and they were building communities. You know, they were they were you know a uh, 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 a strong minded people. You know, our Lord calls us the salt of the earth. So what does what does salt do to food? It flavors it. So when you put when when you talk about being the salt of the earth, well, we're, we're, wherever the Lord may put us. In turn, you know, that area may flourish. So when they sold us to the Greeks, that was around the 1600s. You had Tyree, Sidon, the Philistines. You had nations of Ham that were so-called Africans that knew, that knew who we were. They knew that we were not the same people. So they said, okay, well, you know, we're, hey, we're not going to get too attached to these people. And in turn, when the Greeks came or the Portuguese, when they came and started enslaving us, you, you, they didn't do nothing about it because the Hamites, the Hamites were, uh, the Hamites are vicious people as well, you know, so you could best believe the Hamites were standing there getting some type of, of, of reward for not in, intervening as well, you know, and you also, as I mentioned, you also had the Arab, the, the, the Arab Muslim slave trade happening at the same time. So you had Arabs and you also had Hamites, which are Africans that were involved in the slave trade as well. So all of these nations from Ham to Ishmael to Edom, the Greeks, they were all involved like a like a, 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 a band of a band of thieves. They were all involved in selling us into slavery. And, and the East African slave trade or the Arab Muslim slave trade was on the East Coast. That's right there next to Mizraim, right there closer to Tyre and Sidon. So they were selling us to the Arabs and they were selling us to the Greeks, the so-called white man. You have sold the you have sold to the Greeks that you may remove them far from their borders. So as I mentioned before, we weren't removed far from our borders when Nebuchadnezzar invaded on Judah and Jerusalem. We were removed far from our borders when the Portuguese invaded on West Africa and took us completely away from the landmass. So uh you know from from Joel chapter 3 and verse 4 to verse 6 you know, that kind of that kind of touched me because it showed how the Lord could have a parable that, that was speaking of two different points in time. So within those three scriptures that talked about during the time of Pharaoh, Necho, during the time when Nebuchadnezzar invaded on Judah and Jerusalem and Pharaoh, 
didn't do nothing about it. You had Tyree and Sidon and the Philistines, you know, getting out away from Pharaoh, you know. And then they left the Israelites there and didn't help them at all. And then you also had the time when we were dwelling in West Africa and East Africa, North Africa, when we were dwelling in the land of Ham, mainly West Africa and East Africa. And you had Tyree, Sidon, the Philistines, Ham, the grandsons of Ham, Cush, Put, Mizraim, and uh, Canaan, as well as the Phil as well as Philistine. You had them selling us to the Arabs and to the Greeks. And the Arab slave trade was from the time of 600 AD all the way to the 1900s. But this shows from verse, verse 4 all the way to verse 6, this shows how complex the Lord can be, you know, how complex the Lord is. And I think Joel... Uh, Shalaki, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll let that be right there. But, um, you know, I'll touch on the point again. Our Lord tells us, uh, our Lord tells us through John the Baptist, it is nothing for the Lord to raise up a child of a son of Abraham from one of these rocks, from one of these stones. So you might see the most hard headed, the most hard headed, ignorant, so called Negro out there doing Lord knows what. But the Lord could still put his hand on him and, and, and call him to be a prophet and call him to be a righteous person, you know, and live that way. So regardless of whether somebody has that outer appearance of being, you know, hard headed or not, hey, you don't want to despise them. You don't want to think, oh, the Lord ain't dealing with that person. Oh, I can do what I want to that person. I could go, you know, I could beat that person's ass if I want I'm not going to get no repercussion for it. You thinking in that way ultimately is the Lord getting you ready for judgment. Because you, regardless, you know that that's a that, that that's a child of Israel, whether they're whether they're rebellious or not. Now for the uh, now for the one third and the hundred and forty four thousand. Uh, and the Lord tells us it'd be better if a great mil if a millstone were hung around one of those people's necks who offend us. Abarazaziah, Yahweh willing, I'm of that number. But for those people who try to offend us, it'd be better if a, if a millstone were hung around his neck and they were drowned in the depths of the sea. So that's real bad. So for you brothers out there who are going through certain things, just know that the Lord is keeping that tally. You know, the Lord is keeping that checklist and that that uh, that list of all the things that they're that they're trying to do to us. That's why when when we go out there, um. You know, we constantly try to reiterate, look, don't be intimidated or embarrassed about coming up and speaking to us. I didn't told a brother before, look, you coming up to me and talking to me in turn, that could have the Lord initiate his, his angels around you, his heads of angels around you so that they protect you so that you can be able to learn and nothing may harm you. You know, you showing, OK, well, hey, I'm going to stand up and I'm going a, I'm to, a, I'm a, uh, you know, I'm going to actually seek the Lord and I don't care what nobody says. You having that energy about you, in turn, the Lord is going to reciprocate that same energy. So he's going to say, okay, I'm going I'm to I'm protect, protect my son. You know, I'm going to protect that son, and, and I'm not going to let nobody harm him so that he can come to the full understanding. And this is why the Lord tells us time and time again that, it, that, the, that the teacher shall not be moved. Our Lord tells us that our angels are always facing the Father. In Matthew chapter 18 and verse 10, the parable of the lost sheep. Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that in heaven, their angels always face the, fa my, the face of my Father who is in heaven. So, uh, as I said, we know two thirds are going to be swept away. That don't mean that the Lord ain't watching the things that people do to him. The Lord is keeping track of everything, you know, and this is why the Lord tells us, don't hate your brother. Don't hate your neighbor. You know, the Lord tells tells Israel as a whole. But he, when he when he, you know, he, he tells us not to have any grudge towards our Israelite brother or sister, because, you know, the Lord is still working with that individual to fulfill his will. And ultimately, when you when you treat somebody wrong, that that ultimately reflects back on you, you know.
Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 9. With my soul I have desired you in the night. Yes, by my spirit within me I will seek you early. For when your judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. And who's, who's inhabiting that seat of power? The so-called white man. So they're really going to learn righteousness. As our Lord gets closer, our Lord tells us that the heavens shall, shall shake, the mountains shall tremble, and the hills shall, uh, shall shake, shall quake. Hey, all of these wicked elite that are sitting in those high exalted positions, as our Lord starts getting closer, he's gonna, they're, uh, they're going to be, be, be shaking in their boots, so to speak. They're going to be folding under pressure. Let grace be shown to the wicked, yet he will not learn righteousness. In the land of uprightness, he will deal unjustly and will not behold the majesty of the Lord. Yahweh, when your hand is lifted up, they will not see, but they will see and be ashamed for their envy of people. Yes, the fire of your enemies shall devour them. So uh, they may not see, they may not see the Lord's hand right now, but when our Lord when our Lord reveals himself, then they're going to see and they're going to be ashamed. All right. Uh, that was simply a quick. Uh, a quick review, you can call it. But um, I'm also going to go into the book of uh, not in this lesson, in the next lesson. I'm also going to go into the book of. Uh. Second Chronicles chapter 21, because I stumbled when I was speaking on my last video and I and this is in the second video around the 13th minute, the 13th minute and the 50th, 50th second. I spoke about King David seeing an angelic angel. But then, you know, a couple seconds later, I said, uh, Daniel, I meant King David. So, you know, I'm going to go back and I'm going to make a lesson on when King David seen an angelic angel. And he seen the angel standing between the heavens and earth. That meant that the angel was flying. He was levitating. But, um, you know, even that within itself, when King David was looking at the angel, he was seeing the essence of heaven, of the third heaven. So although that angel was in the earthly realm, when King David was looking at it, you can best believe he was seeing the essence and the, the, the beauty of the kingdom of heaven. Um. All right, now I'm going to go to uh, Daniel, Daniel chapter 8 and verse 1. Now this is going into a vision that Daniel had during the time period of Belshazzar. And after this, I'm going to drop back down to Daniel chapter 6.